Good afternoon and welcome to this session of Science Week at the University of Lincoln. Today I'm going to talk about agricultural robotics or agri-robotics activities that are taking place in the Lincoln Institute for Agri-Food Technology, which we call LIAT. My name is Professor Elizabeth Sklar and I'm the research director for Lincoln Agri-Robotics. I'm joined today by two of our PhD students who are representing our LIAT team. And after I give you a brief overview, each of them will tell you about their research and a little bit about how they got into doing this kind of science. The Lincoln Institute for Agri-Food Technology, or LIAT, is an interdisciplinary research institute within the University of Lincoln's College of Science. As you can see from the diagram on the right-hand side, we're sitting in the middle here amongst a number of other uh, schools and uh, units around the parts of the university. And we take in lots of different kinds of research from, um, take into account lots of different kinds of research from different entities to focus ourselves on the agriculture and horticulture industry. Our institute is located on the Rise Home campus, which is pictured here. It's a 200 hectare farm located about four and a half miles outside of the city center. Liat is home to a relatively new research center called Lincoln Agri-Robotics. It's the world's first global center of excellence in agricultural robotics. And it was funded by the UK government's um, Research England initiative in August, 2019. The activities in Lincoln Agri-Robotics focus on three main grand challenges, selective harvesting, crop care, and robotic phenotyping. On the next three slides, I'm gonna show you a little bit about what each of those activities or challenges is. So selective harvesting, and I have an animation here showing you, is about picking a strawberry using novel, soft, or non-contract grippers. You can see in the animation that certain strawberries are being highlighted with green and red boxes. The green box indicates that the strawberry is ripe and ready for harvesting, whereas the red box indicates that the strawberry is not ready for harvesting. The boxes are created by having a camera on the, on the robot take pictures of strawberries and, and analyze the images taken to determine which things are ready for being harvested. Crop care involves identifying and removing weeds that attack individual plants while scaling to cover whole farms. You'll notice in the animation that there's a similar kind of technology going on. There's a camera that's taking pictures of the crops and the weeds, and these are being distinguished the, from each other using artificial intelligence techniques. And the weeds that have been identified in this instance are being sprayed. We're using this technology to inform both uh, spot spraying and mechanical types of weeding. The third grand challenge is around what's called robotic phenotyping gathering data on plant traits, weeds, pests, and disease using a, a number of different approaches which scale with novel and traditional sensor technologies. You'll see the same kind of activity going on here. You've got the camera taking pictures and sending data back to an uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning kinds of algorithms that are operating um, some on board the robot and some are being transmitted to um, other computers elsewhere to analyze the data and determine what the objects are in the images. In this case, as you saw in the animation, we have different kinds of tomatoes being highlighted as well as some weeds. We believe that the fourth agricultural revolution is robotics and we're showing here that the transition over the last 30 years from um, the, the types of machines that you see more commonly in the field to machines that you are starting to see today that we are helping to develop, which involve using these kinds of technologies that you've just seen in the animations being integrated with existing farm machinery. 
Thank you for listening to my part of the presentation. And now I'm going to hand over to my uh, colleagues, Will and Sam. So yes, yeah, so a good afternoon. Um, I'm Will Smith, uh, and I'm going to talk to you about sort of my pathway uh, into becoming a weed scientist. So currently, I'm a PhD student uh, at the University of Lincoln, um, and my research is sort of fits into that crop care uh, pathway that Elizabeth just introduced, whereby we're using camera technology uh, combined with mechanical control uh, to to get rid of weeds. Uh, I'm also a researcher at NIAB, which is a crop research organization based in Cambridge. And I'm doing something very similar, uh, working on uh, commercial field trials, uh, sort of to answer similar sort of questions, um, all to do with weeds and how to get rid of them. So when I talk about sort of applied weed science, I'm very much working on the end of the spectrum that works directly with farmers. And a lot of the work that I'm doing will directly feed into how they operate and work their farms which is really, really, really rewarding. Um, oh, that's gone back, what is? So when I talk about, so there's several elements to this. We have plant biology. So this is talking about when and how plants, when they emerge and how they grow and how they interact with the environment and other plants around them. There's the element of soil science, which is obviously supports the growth of these plants and how interactions with that uh, might, might, inter, might reflect on the weed species that emerge. There's also things like physical chemistry, uh, where we're using herbicides and other, other chemicals to control these weeds. So understanding uh, these processes is really important. And then there's the mechanics. So as I said, I'm, I'm using mechanical control. So I'm using tractors and we're using implements that need an understanding of mechanics and how that influences uh, and, it, and informs our level of weed control. So it's really, really diverse, which is really exciting. So really, obviously, as I said, working with plants, and I think overall there's nearly 400,000 species of plants, and they're all incredibly diverse. Um, and they're really, really highly re relied upon by humans. And I think that's all I just wanted to introduce this as a, as a wider topic, because obviously we all hopefully know things about like oxygen production, so the, the chain of removing CO2 from the atmosphere and turning into oxygen for us to breathe, which also has a role in mitigating and uh, adapting to the climate change. Uh, they obviously produce building materials in, in the form of wood, um, possibly more historically, but certainly moving to the future, we're looking to more sustainable um, resources and certainly wood is one of these. They also contribute to fuel. Uh, and again, generally wood is the primary uh, source of that. Medicines, which is a really interesting part and something that uh, although they often seem like they are just uh, chemical ingredients, actually, a lot of the influences and ideas come from nature. Uh, the Amazon is the home to some of the most uh, well used medicines and some of the compounds that we use are found in nature and in plants. And then what really what I'm talking about, and that's the, the fact that all of our food uh, is related to plants. And that's whether we are directly eating the plant itself, or whether we're eating livestock and other animals that have fed fed on plants for their life. When we're using plants for food, um, we are talking now about a, a modern industrial process. Since sort of the 10,000 BC, there was an area called the Fertile Crescent. And in that area, we have managed to, uh, the, the first wheat was bread. So wheat is it's used in flour and then also used in bread and baking and cakes and lots and lots of other things. Um, this was then bread to produce food. And over time, we've managed to create more and more productive varieties. Uh, which are able to give us more and more grain and ultimately feed the, the, the growing population we have. Now, by domesticating a product, or in this case, a plant, they need a little bit more looking after it in the same way that while we don't tend to look after our foxes and wild dogs, we do tend to take our, take our, our domestic pets to the vet to make sure they've had, had their jabs. In exactly the same way, we need to be looking after our crops. So this sort of science or art is sort of known as agronomy. So this, so we have a job as a, an agronomist. You go around the fields, checking on the, on, the, on the plants and checking that they're all being taken care of and overall the crops are looking really well. A large part of this is the protection from pests and diseases. So um, in the UK, things like yellow rust is a big, big disease and these collectively are able to reduce the amount of yield 
that the plants can produce, which obviously has an effect both on the global food supply, um, but also the, the economics of a farming business. As I say, it isn't just about um, sustaining individual people or a local community. We're talking about one farm feeding thousands and thousands of people. So where do I fit into this? So I'm on that sort of in that pest and disease area. I'm very much on the pests and one of those pests and probably the greatest pest if left unchecked is the weeds. So uh, a weed species uh, is typically defined as, a, as any plant that is in the wrong place. So um, it isn't defined by the species itself. Sometimes some of the plants that we don't we're trying to get rid of in our arable crops are really useful in other places. But still, when we're trying to grow a nice wheat crop or a nice potato crop, we don't want this competition with these with these other plants. So historically, herbicides and, as I said, as a form of chemical have been used. And these are incredibly clever pieces of innovation in the sense that they can uh, be very selective and can take out certain plants amongst other plants and so using certain um, metabolic pathways within these within the different species. However, these are under a lot of pressure. I mean, some of you may have sort of seen in the news, news stories around glyphosate is a big one. Um, and the pressure under the how, whether we should still be using these types of chemicals and their other effects on the environment. Now, all of those are valid, but at the moment, they're very effective. So we need to find other very effective uh, solutions to controlling weeds. Um, otherwise, we, we risk having a food, well, risk having a food shortage, but certainly risk having substantially reduced yields. Now, some of these new techniques need to be evaluated. It's not an overnight process. So that's really what my, my research is doing and, uh, and also my job. So in terms of the specifics of my research, as I said, I'm finding ways to kill weeds without herbicides. And one of these techniques is to use um, mechanical cultivation. So we're using a metal tines that move through the soil at a reasonable speed um, to disrupt and dislodge um, weed species that are lying in between the rows of the crop. So uh, on the right hand side, there's a photo with a sort of a metal, metal square around it and then a quadrat. And then within that, I'm counting all of the weeds that are in there before and after a cultivation. So, but what you can also make out in that photo is sort of three sort of definitive crop rows. So um, the sort of machine that I'm using uh, is able to use a camera to see where those crop rows are and move the cultivation implement between those rows so that it doesn't damage the crop, but it also it does, it does do the most amount of damage possible to the weed itself. And in terms of like a day to day, there's obviously it's, it's an incredibly uh, interesting and diverse um, type of job. There's this huge amount of counting. We're creating lots of um, quantitative data, um, both on the weed itself uh, and on the crop, but also the soil and all of the other surrounding factors that might influence um, this, this, this type of technique. So, and I've just got a quick video. And I'll try and pause it sometimes just to explain a little bit what's going on. But this is a machine uh, on the back of a tractor. And as you sort of see, it's currently lined up. Um, some of these uh, tines are currently lined up in between the crop rows. So I'll let this play. Oh, let this play. Hopefully, that will be a bit better this time. As you see, they're slightly moving left and right slightly, and that's the camera. There's a on the left-hand side of the tractor. There's a there's a camera guiding it between the rows, and they're moving left and right, uh, just micro adjustments to make sure that the the weeds are being suitably disrupted. I think one of the really nice things, obviously, about working in agriculture, and it's not absolutely everybody, uh, is is the ability to be outside quite a lot of the time. Um, I can't underestimate that, and it's it's been been lovely over this sort of coronavirus pandemic period, but. So this is a, let's go into a bit of a close up. You can see that the, the crop there is being left untouched, really healthy, growing away lovely in sunshine. And here, I'll, we'll just, I won't pause it because I think it might mess it up, but you can see some of these, you see, as I said, the, 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 the crop rows and in between it, you can sort of make out some slightly different types of weeds, or different types of plants, which are the weeds, and that's moving through, disrupting them. So. I can now pass you over to my colleague, Sam, and he's going to talk to you a bit more about the actual robotics side. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Hi there, uh, my name is Sam and uh, I'm a PhD student, uh, specifically from the robotics uh, perspective. And uh, my talk will actually uh, be constrained uh, from technical uh, point of view on how it's going to impact agriculture. And um, my research is under the concept of human robot teaming to support agriculture, uh, agriculture activities. And more specifically, it's more optimizing task roles in uh, a team of humans and robots in a farm. So how can we look into the future where robots and humans are cooperating in the farm environment? Because we know population is increasing and food is a demand as an increase of population. And robots are here to help farmers to work together. Now, um, if farmers and uh, robots are going to uh, coordinate together in a farm, we have to actually say that humans have their strengths and weaknesses, and robots, they also have their strengths and weaknesses. And in any team, you got to be able to balance your team members who are the best in certain activities and who are weak in certain activities. So if we are to look at human beings, you might find relative to robots, humans are still smarter. They are very adaptive in, their, in the changes in the environment. We have critical thinking, uh, high critical thinking, and we have uh, a conscience of safety and so on. While weaknesses are like, you get tired too quickly, you can get bored repeating the same thing over and over, and then you're prone to doing some errors, uh, especially if there are two mentioned, they dominate. So, but if you look also with the robots, some of the strength they have is that they are faster in doing some of the activities, they are consistent, uh, and in that the repeatability of a task is high, they are more accurate in doing their tasks, and they can give even extra abilities like night vision, so they are not interrupted by daylight when and darkness. Uh, weaknesses of robots, they are prone also to system failure. Sometimes some of them are constrained to particular tasks, so they are not able, they cannot be flexible at times to do other things. And uh, energy limitations is also a thing uh, robots face, especially like drones, you've seen one of the images uh, Will has, uh, uh, has exposed to you that drones can be used to spray in the farm, but the flight time is usually a problem. So some of these uh, qualities in a team need to be balanced. Now, here's an example of teams uh, that can be formed between humans and robots. You can have a team that just simply has one human and one robot, and also you can have a team with one human and fleets of robots. So you can see now that we have a variety of teams, a variety of uh, ways of uh, creating teams in a farm. And also the final or rather another uh, perspective of a team can be many humans and having fleets of robots uh, working together. Now there's uh, one technical term we can implement when we are trying to make humans and robots uh, work as a team. And one uh, of these uh, terms we call it mixed initiative interaction. This is simply the idea that uh, an agent or a team member contributes uh, what is best suited at an appropriate time. Because we have, as we have mentioned, each member can have weaknesses and strengths. So depending on certain situation, each one of them will take over initiate the immediate next task that needs to be done. And this can now lead to what we call multi-agent collaboration. And uh, some of these collaboration can be uh, things like human and a software agent, or software agent and a robot, or a human and a robot, or even the three of them, human, software, and robot, all of them cooperating together. So with such an approach with uh, robotics uh, techniques that we know of, we can try and transfer this concept in the farm 
and uh, try and see how effective they can be. Uh, to make you better understand the concept of teaming and mixed initiative interaction, I will use an analogy of video, video game. I uh, believe maybe some of you have played video games uh, at least some point in, uh, in, in your life uh, somewhere. So this is one of the common uh, video games that is very popular uh, related to football. Now, uh, in football, we tend to have teams, but in computer science, we, we call them like software agents that human beings interact with them through game pads, like the ones you can see in front of you. So you find we have two gamers who are interacting with teams of software agents trying to move them depending as per the desires of what they want to do. For example, I've narrowed down a task that human beings when they're interacting with uh, agents in a game, they normally do. This is a shared task of reclaiming a ball. So uh, a human being is able to probably control one agent at a time or even sometimes two or three or more. But let's assume he's able to control one of them. And in such a case scenario, he's going to take uh, the software agent who is closest or uh, best suit to reclaim the ball. And then the other agents, which are being controlled by the computer, they will try and analyze the best uh, actions they can take to support the agent that is being controlled by the human being and so on. So we have a sequence of a gamer observes the, uh, and selects the suitable agent. Software agents analyze what is happening and also the gamer continues observing what uh, is happening. So there's a, there's a transition every time from human to computer. They're trying to balance each other so that they can eventually do the task of reclaiming the ball. So the same concept of uh, a computer algorithms or other computer program working with a human being trying to uh, solve a problem, that's the, what we are also going to try to do with robots. So here in uh, Rhizome Campus, this is an example of a robotics lab where you can see we have fleets of robots in, uh, in the lab and uh, we, we can do a number of experiments to try and see how we can interact a human and a fleet of robots, how they can cooperate together to solve a certain task. Now, uh, there's another thing we, we are trying to focus on, which is uh, types and sizes of robots. At the moment, uh, as you've also seen with other images uh, my previous colleagues have showed you, is that we have large machinery that are working in the farm, but we are trying to also expand and include even smaller machines or rather smaller robots for our case scenario. And uh, this is uh, the reason why we are approaching this is because some of those large machines could be costly and constrained to certain roles. While these uh, smaller robots will aid to further do other roles that could not be achieved like, uh, with the other larger machines. And uh, and uh, they are also cost, cost effective. And if deploying these cheap robots will be able to allow us to have teams of robots. This is a small uh, clip just to show you uh, the early stages of uh, what we are doing in Verizon Campus. We are just trying to see if actually we can implement this uh, approach of small robots in the farm. And uh, to your left is the physical robot moving in the garden and uh, to your right is just a simple station of the same robot but in a simulating environment because at times you would prefer to test your computer programs and so on before you go to the actual to the field itself to do one or two things you prefer yeah um the applications for for teams of uh, these small robots we, I will introduce two terminologies. One of them is robotic phenotyping, and this simply uh, means more gathering data to determine, analyze, or predict uh, traits of plants in the farm using different modes of perception, uh, 
the robot could be given either through what we call RGB cameras. Uh, they give you not only color, because you have very uh, many plants with different colors, it will also give you things like distance of how close or far, and many so on, and even how big or small the plants are. And thermal cameras, they will also give uh, the robot the ability to, to uh, perceive the temperature uh, differences and so on. Uh, the other thing is uh, soil sampling. This is uh, more trying to get uh, data from the soil itself, whether it has correct nutrients, uh, how much water is in there and so on. And uh, if we have simple small robots that are able to be deployed in large farm, then if they are, we, are, we can try and optimize how these tasks are being done at a quicker rate. Uh, yes, that's my small presentation of what my, my PhD study will focus on. And thank you for listening. Uh, any questions, would love to hear from you guys. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Sam, and thank you, Will. So we have a number of questions showing up in the comments, and I'm going to run through them. The first question is for Will. Question about weed growth. Do you tackle or how do you tackle or spray the weeds when you first identify them? Or is there an optimum period to remove them, say on day seven or before, to avoid any spread? Okay, that's, the, that's a really, really, really good question, actually. Um, so, yes, ideally, there's an optimum period, there's a, a theoretical weed-free period for certain crops and certain weed combinations. So, ideally, in an ideal world, you would identify your weeds and be able to go and spray them and kill them within this within this weed free um within this weed free period so uh, for something like winter wheat um that weed free period um can extend all the way from october to uh to april so ideally to reduce any crop uh, any crop yield reduction you'd want to keep your crop completely free of weeds during that period um in terms of actually tackling them Again, ideally, we would use a, a contact spray, so you spray it on and it can enter the weeds and cause fatality. However, we have this issue with resistance. So this is where the weeds have developed mechanisms that um, can uh, break down the herbicides within them or uh, as one method uh, and therefore isn't affected by, 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 this, by the herbicide. So we've now had to move to a system where we actually spray the crop with a herbicide before the weeds have actually come up. So we're, we're sort of hedging our bets a little bit to go, well, hopefully some weeds would come up if I don't put this herbicide on. So we're now in a um, in a proactive situation where we have to be using pesticides to prevent weeds, uh, pre prevent the risk of weeds. Um, and that's one of the sort of the nice things about using mechanical control, you return to a more uh, reactive scenario. So actually you only need to use weed control when the weeds are present. Um, within a large field, weeds aren't in every single square meter of that field. But at the moment we are spraying every single square meter of that field just in case weeds come up. So um, moving to this sort of new technology or newer technology uh, helps in lots of lots of ways. It means we're reducing pesticides and it hopefully means that we've got a more effective farm or a more, more efficient farm where we're not doing jobs just on the off chance some weeds come up. Great, thank you, Will. I'm gonna uh, go to a question for Sam now. There's uh, multiple questions for each of you, so we'll, we'll alternate. Um, so Sam, uh, super interesting talk. If a human is able to complete a task on their own, can the software agents pair up um, or more to share work where a task, when a task is further behind? Um, okay, uh, so when uh, the thing is, uh, the aim uh, we are trying to do is that uh, it's more of a dialogue between the robot and the human. So if a human being is not able to fully understand what's happening, or rather the robot is not fully able to understand what is happening, at times we can find that uh, they will try to balance how they understand the environment status 
So if a human being has a gap that uh, needs to be filled, the robot may try to give possible answers to what needs to be done. And likewise, if a human being has certain gaps that the robot needs to uh, be provided, uh, the human being provides it to the robot. So the two will try to work depending on how much each of them, they have amount of knowledge uh, situated to either the errors that are being encountered or the next steps that need to be done uh, during the task. Great, thank you, Sam. Okay, alternating back to Will. Will, how transferable is your research to different crops and different parts of the world? Uh, so I suppose simply very, it's very transferable. So um, my research is in winter wheat and specifically against um, a grass wheat called, called black grass, which is um, structurally similar to winter wheat. Um, I think that the the, the interesting part is how my research, because it's tailored to a specific weed and it grows in a certain way, in different crops in different parts of the world, the the weeds come up at different times to the crop. So when you carry out these cultivation um, uh, cultivations may, may, may change how effective they are. So just putting the imprint of what we do in winter wheat into, uh, into a crop of carrots probably won't work very well. So it's then uh, finding out how we need to change, whether it's the timing or whether it's the type of blade or, or type of um, like the way we actually disturb the soil, whether those factors need to change for different crops and indeed different parts of the world, which might have different soil types um, uh, and, and different weather conditions. So yes, yeah, very, very low. Great. Thank you, Will. Okay, and another question for Sam. Sam. Can the software agents choose on their own where to apply their efforts? Um, now that uh, is where it comes to good uh, programming, uh, rather uh, algorithms, what we call them, in that uh, can you make algorithms that are ad robust and adaptable to uh, what is currently happening when the task is being done? So we are trying our best not to give human beings uh, as much burden when it comes to solving tasks in the farm. So we are, it's still an early stage uh, thing that is ongoing, even as I've given you an example in uh, games and so on. We are continuing to use AI techniques where we are giving computer uh, machinery or other computers ability to think for themselves by gaining uh, data from the environment so that they can make uh, suitable choices for themselves without a human being keep on telling them what to do or not to do. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Sam. So the next question is for both of you, and it's less about the specifics of your technology and more about your career paths and how you've gotten into the science that you're doing and what made you decide to be a PhD student. So just to alternate, we'll go back to Will, so can you um, explain, you know, sort of what led you to this PhD and what things did you know about beforehand and what did you need to learn while you were a PhD student? So Will, can you start please? Yeah, of course. Um, so I think as I sort of said, so I also work for a, a crop research organization uh, down in Cambridge and I did this, I uh, did my degree in agriculture and then I went into and I worked for them. So I'm, I'm still working for them but for five years before I did my PhD. So. I was already sort of fairly well skilled in sort of like the practical side, uh, weed identification, setting up trials, um, uh, where to do that, uh, some of the factors around why you choose a certain area of the field. And therefore, what I've sort of had to learn is a bit more of the, 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 the preliminary steps. So actually, how do you set up a trial mathematically so that you have um, a really good um, experimental design so you can get some really robust data that can be properly statistically an analyzed and then also that that um, process of analyzing data um, was something I was I suppose, weak on and I've had to sort of pick up quite quickly uh, for my PhD um, and not just the not just the actual what you do to analyze your data but actually the how and increasingly so um, use a program called R which is a open source 
uh, piece of software for, anal uh, for analyzing data, but and lots of other things. But uh, so as, as sort of like computer science language and learning those sorts of programming languages is is sort of what I've had to pick up, and that's that's sort of my my biggest uh, learning step, I think, suppose. Great, thank you, Will. Sam, what about you? What things did you know before you started your PhD and what are you learning now as a PhD student? And I, I should say that Sam's in his first year as a PhD student, so um, hopefully you still have a lot more to learn. <laughs> yes, thank you uh, for that. Yes, I'm a new PhD student, as has been said, but at the same time, I've uh, also had my own career path that led me to interest to do a research and uh, one of the things was that even from high school level, I used to get interest in physics and uh, mathematics and so on. And uh, that built an interest into engineering. And uh, in engineering, it's very broad, but uh, having interest in different scientific uh, perspective, I got a, an answer of how to integrate my interest together and one of the subject or field of interest was mechatronics. It is because that field enabled me to combine mechanical engineering. It enabled me to combine electrical and electronic engineering and eventually also computer science techniques. So it was an interesting journey in my undergraduate when I did mechatronics because uh, it uh, gave me a little bit of here and there of how to uh, utilize different fields to make uh, really interesting projects. And uh, in my master's level, I narrowed it down to a little bit more now from just mechatronics to robotics. And still robotics is uh, broad by itself because we need to combine different elements, just as mechatronics to combine mechanical, electrical, and computer science. So not until I got in more interested in different uh, robotic techniques, I say to myself, how about I go to research and uh, explore now in a deeper uh, direction of implementing the real world applications. Because like in agriculture, I found that there's many gaps that have not yet been filled with robotics. So it's a, it was a chance for me now to see if I can get my hands dirty into that in this field. Cheers. Great. Thank you, Sam. So um, I'm going to uh, continue asking you a bit about your uh, the research and um, kind of what led you to where you are now. And thinking back to when you were secondary school students, what kinds of things do you think students current who are currently in secondary school could be doing to prepare themselves if they look at what you're doing and say, ooh, that's exciting. I want to be doing agri-robotics in five, 10 years time. What uh, what advice would you give them? What starting with Will? Um, so I think uh, part of it, uh, yeah. So for my A levels, I did the sort of fairly typical biology, maths, and um, chemistry <laughs> a while ago now. Um, but I also did history, and I think that gave me um, a slightly different view on things, and it, the way scientific A-levels are set up and how they're tested and all the exam processes. I don't think that it gives you some of the essay writing and critical analysis. So by doing a subject that doesn't necessarily seem directly appropriate to maybe your possible career path, doing something that's slightly different, um, a you out of your comfort zone, which is always a really good skill to have, but it also teaches you some skills uh, around that, which when you go into, uh, into possibly into university or into a job and then further or further, further research, you need to have these skills around critical analysis looking at papers um, and so a, a history element, although not necessarily the topic, the actual skills that gives you is really important. I think um, I'd also suggest that certainly um, wasn't so prevalent when I was at school, but certainly some of this, this, this computer languaging type computer science is, it, it is absolutely everywhere. Um, it's not it is everywhere in agriculture, but it's everywhere and everywhere. <laughs> so much that it sounds mental, but uh, it is it is there. Um, so you really pick up on some of these languages and and, and making use of those and, and practice them. I think that it's a it's a skill that is, it is a language. Um, and I did do French at one point, and I can't order an ice cream anymore. So you need to pick up and practice these languages. 
Great, thanks, Will. I, I completely resonate with your comments about having done history. When I was an undergraduate, I my primary subject was computer science, but I also studied uh, English um, and did a lot of writing, and that has really helped me in my academic research career. Um, and I can, as a professor, I can always tell when I have students who have done some writing uh, continuing through school and those who have not. Um, and so uh, you, you also do your professors a favor if you've done a bit of writing going through school. So yeah. um, Sam, um, back to you with the, with the same question. What advice would you give, you know, thinking back to when you were a secondary school student and what's led you here what advice would you give to current students about um, who might want to pursue this field yeah. for their career? Um, to be honest, uh, if you're coming in the direction of a technical field, you tend to have to make uh, your hands uh, practical if, uh, if possible, because uh, when you're solving real world problems, it's no longer just theoretical and uh, uh, writing them in the bo on the books. So if you get a chance uh, doing practicals in school, whether you're giving uh, tasks in the lab, you can do some extra uh, activities by trying to understand what uh, happens if you alter these and that. You will tend to build interest of uh, modifying uh, different techniques that are being used at the moment. And uh, things will add up in the direction of uh, being creative and uh, for me i used to like practicals a, a lot so I i'm not uh, emphasizing that somebody in the lab to go and play around with electronics and uh, and yeah so you have still to follow the guidelines your lab technicians will uh, give you but i believe every technician in the lab is curious is happy to see a curious student who wants to make projects that uh, are interesting and so on. So I will tell the students to make an effort to do projects in the lab. That's great advice, Sam. And certainly something, you know, when I was in secondary school a long time ago, um, you didn't have the same kind of availability for, for small inexpensive kits that you could say work on at home. So. Um, you know, Arduinos and some of these kinds of electronics that you can pick up as a hobbyist. Um, there's access to maker spaces and, you know, kinds of things that would really help you um, understand what the technology is so when you're studying it at, at university. You have a, a deeper, much deeper understanding is really useful. Um, great. Thank you, guys. So I'm going to return back to the research that you each are doing now and ask you to just think about the future of the, of the sector. Um, you know, um, our, our listeners here who are in secondary school now, you know, it will be a number of years before they'd be in a position to be finishing a PhD, for example. So, so thinking ahead five, seven years from now, what do you think um, is the future of the sector, you know, focusing on, on agri-robotics? Um, and what are the sort of national challenges in the UK and, and more global challenges? Uh, what work do you think will be um, really relevant in the next you know, seven year time frame? Um, and I'm going to mix things up and go to Sam first. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, okay, uh, one thing we should understand, we are having, like as you said, climate changes and so on. It's a big thing that uh, we are trying to transfer from traditional energy uh, sources, resources to green energy. Even our vehicles nowadays are becoming hybrid and electrical. And majority of our robots, uh, or rather robots that can be implemented in the farm, they will tend to be uh, green, uh, driven by green energy, like batteries and so on. And uh, Having such machineries in the farm will enable us to cut down the carbon uh, emissions and also being able to analyze with robots how plants are uh, growing. It will uh, be able to uh, regulate how fertilizers and pesticides are being used in the farm. And that's also chemical reduction because we know some chemicals also affect our climate. So. All these things, uh, we are trying to see how robots can actually 
participate in these global challenges, not only in UK, but yeah, in uh, other nations as well. Yeah. Great, thank you, Sam. Will, what do you think? Do you have anything to add about the future? <laughs> uh, no, no, not really. Uh, it sounds, it sounds really well, I think um, uh, agriculture in general and British agriculture in particular uh, is going to have an incredibly bright and positive future. I think it's it's a really wide, diverse area. So um, there's a place for everybody, which is always good. But within that climbing, a changing climate type of scenario, um, our diets are changing. They're going to have to change. Um, and that's going to involve new crops and new techniques. So for, for me, as I, we talk about pesticides and reducing them and how do we still control weeds, we still need to feed our planet and we still need to feed the people who are here. So, um, and we still need to do that in a really efficient or more efficient way um, with probably less inputs. Um, and research into that is going to be really important because otherwise, obviously, if we don't have food, um, it's, it's a bit of a, a, bit of a, a very much a, a, a very basic problem uh, that needs to be solved. Um, but because of a changing diet, it's not going to be the same crops. So um, applying some of these techniques to, to, to new novel crops um, is certainly going to be a big challenge because we've been so reliant on what we've done for the last 60 years and we're asking for a lot of change in a short period of time. So, Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, and Will, given that you've got a bit of an industry perspective uh, with your work experience, what do you see as, as a big challenge for taking the kind of uh, machinery that you're working on for your PhD and um, and us seeing those kind of machines all over the country? Um, uh, labor is, is, is actually a, a, a big challenge. Um, at the moment where, although there's lots of downsides to conventional agriculture, the, one of the positive ones is actually, it, it requires very few people to, 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 to work on the land. And when you move to these slightly more um, intent, uh, yeah, I mean, it is almost a more extensive system, but it needs more people to do it. So uh, the cultivator we use or I'm using is much slower than a typical sprayer. So um, solving um, issues with, with, with labor, not just as in on the farm labor, but also when we talk about robotics, the people who are capable of fixing them, working with them day to day, making sure that they're, they're able to, um, to carry out those tasks reliably. Um, because agriculture doesn't really wait, it, it, it's a season, so you don't, you can't go, oh, that's right, I'll do that job next week. The, 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 the crop often dictates when you can do the jobs, so um, you need to be able to have a reliable um, system. So uh, I'm not really sure if that's given you an answer, but anyway. <laughs> no, it does give an answer, and it, and it resonates with one of the things that I'm always saying as a roboticist is that, you know, we're developing robots to work alongside people, and we don't see robots as replacing labor, we see robots as um, sort of responding to shifts in the labor needs around the country and around the world. And I think, you know, your comments reflect that very nicely. So I think we're getting, uh, we've got to the end of our, of our questions. And uh, I want to thank Sam and Will for spending the time with us today. And uh, hopefully all of you listening have learned something about agricultural robotics and the activities we're doing at the University of Lincoln. Thank you for uh, watching and joining us. And um, please don't hesitate to be in touch. You can find our webpage off of the university main site um, and we'll be happy to answer questions going forward. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.